Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, it's Magic Molly here bringing you another magical movie review. Every Sunday I like to sit down, watch movies, and talk about them with my friends. Um, and so I decided to make that a hobby that I shared with the internet because that's where you put things now. If you aren't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you can keep up with all of the magical movie reviews to come. And if you haven't been following along so far, all of my magical movie reviews uh, in this series are following the Disney princesses. And we've been reviewing them in uh, release date order. So last week we did Mulan, which was released in 1998. And this week, we are moving on to uh, The Princess and the Frog, which was released in 2009. So we're jumping over a decade um, into the next Disney princess film. So I have a ton of thoughts uh, from just what I watched in the movie, and also a ton of just facts to bring you from my origin story research. For those of you who've been following along, you know I'm a huge nerd and I have to know where all of these Disney stories came from. So we'll be diving into that at the end of the video, so stick around for that. We will go ahead and get started. The way that I like to start these movie reviews is with a magical recap. Now magical recaps are my way of reminding you guys of the plot if you haven't seen the movie in a while or if you've never seen the movie then you can kind of get the gist of what the, the story is about. Um, and if you haven't seen this one I definitely would go ahead and recommend that you watch it. It's a quick recap of the plot. Try to deliver it in about 30 to 40 seconds if I can manage it. I was trying to do them in 30 seconds or less, but that was turning into a ridiculously short amount of time. Mostly because these stories are getting more and more detailed. Like when we're starting with Snow White, I mean, it's just like girl in the woods, like stays in a house with seven dudes, almost die, but she doesn't. And then a prince saves her. Like that's it. So th those were like super easy to do in 30 seconds, but Princess and the Frog, can't guarantee that, but we will do it as quickly as possible. Yes, I did write it down, so I'm looking at my computer while I'm reading it because I just don't memorize these yet, maybe in the future. Um, and also, ain't nobody got time for that these days. Tiana's mother reads her and Lottie the story of the princess and the frog. Tiana's like, ew, that's gross. They go home and make gumbo with her dad and dream of opening their own restaurant, Tiana's place. Cut to the 20s and Tiana's working her ass off to make sure that that dream comes true for her and her dad who didn't get to see it happen. A prince is coming to town named Nabeen and Lottie's having a party at her house to try to woo him. Tiana is bringing her food magic. Prince Naveen gets to town and meets Dr. Facilier, who turns him into a frog. Naveen makes it to the party, but mistakes Tiana for being the princess since she is in the costume. They kiss and she turns into a frog. All hell breaks loose. Dr. Facilier is after Naveen for his blood. His shadows are tracking them down. They run into all kinds of frog slash bayou mess. They learn that he can get a kiss from a princess and they will both turn human again. But they end up falling in love instead and they would rather be together as frogs than not be together as humans. So they set off to live happily ever after in the bayou, have a frog wedding, kiss on the frog mouth, turn into humans again, and happy ever after. That was a bad. I'd say that that was one of my better ones. But that's about it. I mean, we're all pretty familiar with the princess and the frog tale. Um, Disney just puts somewhat of their own little twist on it. Uh, and we'll get to the origin story, but there's a couple different um, origins that Disney's pulling from. So, when I'm watching my favorite movies, I like to pick out magical moments that happen for me. These are things that really make me think or I find really entertaining or things that just give me the warm fuzzies. And there were so many in this film that I didn't even catch the first time I watched it. Right off the bat, of course, the intro song which I believe is used at the Disney parks during one of the, the projection or the fireworks shows, um, just gives me the warm fuzzies of like, the song is putting you in the mood for a Disney movie. Um, the evening star is shining bright, so make a wish and hold on tight. There's magic in the air tonight and anything can happen. Just the prologue music just automatically sunk me into like 
being ready to be washed over by Disney magic. So it made me a little, I'd say emotional is too strong of a word, but I was definitely really into the Disney music. And then another magical moment for me in the very beginning, what I didn't realize is that the directors for this movie also directed Aladdin and The Little Mermaid um, and will direct Moana in a couple years when we do that review. Um, and so there's quite a few Little Mermaid and Aladdin Easter eggs in there, which I find really humorous. And one of those is after they show the scene of them being children, um, young Tiana and young Charlotte, they like pan over New Orleans and there's like people in the streets and it's really showing you the culture. And there's someone shaking a rug and it's actually the magic carpet and I didn't even notice that the first time. And I thought that that was super magical. I even <laughs> I made Adam, I was like, where's the remote? And I like wanted to rewind it so that he could catch it too. I'd say that this is one of my favorite Disney soundtracks. Um, all of the songs are so incredibly catchy um, and make me tap my foot the entire time. Almost There, Friends on the Other Side, When We're Human, Dig a Little Deeper, like they're all just so good. And I mean, just Randy Newman is an amazing songwriter anyway. And I think that might be a little bit why I like it so much because it reminds me like the tunes and the, the, the beats are very Toy Story-esque, which I do love Toy Story a lot and I love Randy Newman. So it's no surprise that I love the soundtrack, but the tunes themselves are good and the lyrics are all just so incredible and smart and catchy. Like it's easy to learn, but it has a meaning at the same time. And I just, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now my two favorite songs and, and specifically magic moments for me while watching the film, uh, Almost There. I love that song. It melts my heart every single time. But not only is the song really good, but they switch the style of animation in the film to match the, the poster that Tiana's been holding on to her entire life that's like a symbol of her dream with her dad of this restaurant that they were gonna open together. Like even in the poster, it's very like vintage travel poster uh, and has a, a whole life on its own. So when she and her mom go visit the, the spot of the restaurant that she wants to open and opens the doors, the animation like lights up the room and it actually changes to match the poster. So it's like showing her dream or her vision coming to life from her imagination and her imagination of what it's gonna look like is almost rooted in the poster that she's been staring at for forever. So I just thought that that was so incredibly symbolic of even though this is her dream now, she's still remembering it as a dream with her father. And the animators did a great job of like bringing that full circle and like all aspects of that song and that scene are all rooted in just her dream and her like memory of her dad, which I thought was really special. And then of course, um, Friends on the Other Side uh, is just a fantastic song. Um, it's really, really catchy and very rooted in the whole like voodoo um, shadow man idea. And I think, I think it was just extremely clever. And then to also have the homage to Dick Van Dyke when he's dancing with the, the little shadows is a like a overwrite of Dick Van Dyke's dancing with the the penguins and Mary Poppins. He does the same thing in, um, or the animators do the same thing in that scene with Dr. Facilier as the shadow man doing his thing uh, with the shadows. So I thought that that was a really cool connection there. But also when he gets them to shake their hands and then he puts like the mask on the animation just goes wild. Like there's all kinds of colors and his face starts getting distorted with kind of like this black magic coming out of him or or maybe he's absorbing it. I don't know, that, that's definitely something that I would have to rewatch and see if it's coming from him. Is it coming from the other side? Is it them morphing together? That's a, 
really weird meta question that I have for myself for this imaginary character. Just love the soundtrack so much and, and I look forward to that song popping up like on my Spotify or Pandora playlists when they shuffle Disney hits. Another magical moment that I listed, which is really more of a magical character, is Lottie or, or Charlotte, Tiana's best friend. Tiana's mom is hired often. They, she doesn't work for Lottie's dad, but he hires her as a seamstress to make her dresses and everything, and uh, which are incredibly beautiful. Like they pan over like 20 different dresses that she's made for her. And I'm like, can you make me one? Which would be great. Even as kids, all the way through their adulthood, it's so incredibly magical to see a Disney princess have a, a, a sister or friend figure that is incredibly supportive. We don't really get that in any other Disney princess film so far. Uh, all of the girls or women that are the princess's age are either like evil stepsisters or like the best friend from Pocahontas is like super skeptical and like not incredibly supportive of the situation or it's more like judging Pocahontas but not really helping her like you're not giving constructive criticism. Lottie is so incredibly warm and open to Tiana and wants her to have everything that she's ever wanted as kids like she's very welcoming to her room and her things and wants to share which is not characteristic of kids but I think it's important here uh, especially as an interracial friendship when they jump to Tiana being older and she's in um, Dukes as a waitress Lottie finds out that Prince Naveen is coming and they're gonna have a, a party. Tiana makes the comment of like, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And so Lottie's like, oh my God, of course, like you have to make your beignets. I feel like in so many other stories, not even just Disney, but like it would have been so easy for her to be like, please, 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 will you make these for our party? She didn't even, she was just like, I'll pay you. She's like, will $500 be enough? Like, take all my money. Like, it's not charity. It's not, like, her asking Tiana to do her a solid. No, you're the best, and I will pay you what you're worth. Like, for your, um, for your services. And, of course, like, she knows that that money would help her open her restaurant, and she wants to be really supportive of that. And I think that that's so incredible of her. Like, of course, Lottie is... A spoiled brat and I think she knows it I don't think she's trying to hide it either she's throwing away somebody else's money to do that but I think it's just like she knows that she has the means to support her friend in that way and also when they get to the party and Tiana finds out that she's not getting the restaurant because somebody else outbid her or whatever like she spills everything and Lottie doesn't like miss a beat she's like okay we're gonna go Naveen I'll be right back like this is her opportunity to marry a prince and she's still putting her friend first. The fact that she's putting her friend's needs and safety first before like her romance story with this prince that she'd never met before today. I love that. And then of course at the end where Naveen and Tiana as frogs find Lottie and are like, you have to kiss Naveen before midnight and we'll turn back into humans. Of course she's like, yeah, oh yeah, I'll marry you. But then when she realizes that Tiana and Naveen love each other, like it's true love, like she doesn't even put up an argument. Like she's like, yeah, I'll kiss you and turn you into a human. Like, like you guys are meant to be together. Like, duh, like I'll kiss you and turn you back into a human. Granted, it doesn't work and they, they miss the, the midnight mark, but that's beside the point. Like it, it was still Lottie being so incredibly willing to give up her dream of just marrying a prince for her friend having true love, which is magical all on its own. Disappointed in myself if I, of course, didn't talk about Tiana as a magical moment all in herself. Um, she's not afraid to speak her mind and stand up to her, for herself. 
sometimes to a fault in that like she's a little guarded and it takes her a while to enjoy herself like she works herself to death but for a specific dream like she's very driven and also i just think it's so incredibly important for representation for young black women to have a disney princess i of course have enough representation so i think sharing the love is more than overdue and also i realized just as i was watching the movie that this is the first american disney princess that we've had so the fact that it's the first American American Disney princess set in America, in New Orleans, with as much culture is that's wrapped in that all on its own, but American princess and is also black, I think is just a step in the right direction. I know that there's so many things that they could have done, that opportunities that were missed, but I think, in and this of course is my opinion, um, but I think that that's, I think it speaks volumes to what Disney's trying to do um, and make up for lost time and also racist movies before, so. I also appreciate Tiana's side of the friendship too. Like while Lottie is all over the place and super spoiled, Tiana is also incredibly supportive of Lottie's dream of finding a prince and she doesn't shame her for that. She doesn't shame her for being more traditional or girly, like while they're so incredibly different and Tiana's more like, I have this dream, I wanna work so hard to make it happen for myself and I know I have to work harder to make my dreams come true because of where I come from. She doesn't fault Lottie for that and I think that that makes their friendship so much more beautiful um, in that regard. Another magical moment for me, um, while I know that there's a lot of scrutiny around Prince Naveen not being a black man also, um, and Disney not being ready for a black prince, um, I still think it's so incredibly magical that there is an interracial couple in a Disney film being represented. I think there just needs to be more attention pointed to that because it's not really something that I ever heard anybody talk about before. I'm sure that there has been. The internet is a big place. I'm sure somebody's talked about it somewhere. I know that the actor um, Bruno Campos is Brazilian, so this is the first Latin uh, prince that we're seeing as well. Enchanting efforts. So enchanting efforts are going to be things that I kind of just was left with question marks above my head about. I honestly couldn't find anything that I really didn't like about the movie. So really these are more of just like, I, I could have used more of or less of these things. I didn't really notice it until we were almost done with the film. I want to understand why Naveen as a frog has teeth, but Tiana as a frog did not have teeth. Like she looked like a gummy old lady as a frog. So like, why is that? Why can't she have some teeth too? I don't know why that bothered me. Thankfully I didn't notice it, so I wasn't thinking about that the entire film. I didn't really notice it until maybe there was 20, 30 minutes left. So I, it's not like I was stewing over it for too long and it's not gonna ruin the movie or anything, but it just didn't really make any sense to me. So that brings us to the VMP. So the VMP is the person that I've identified as the very magical person, the person that brings the most entertainment or value to the story. And to be quite honest, I, I'm i gonna have to pick two people. As I was thinking about the reasons and weighing the pros and cons for and against both of them, I realized that their pros and cons like go together really well. For my VMP, or my VMPs, I'm choosing Tiana and Lottie, both as individuals, but as their friendship as well. For all of the reasons that I've already said, I just think it's so incredibly important to see an interracial friendship, especially for young women, and also see those friends supporting each other in the ways that they're able to, and just in a beautiful way. I think that their relationship 
in the movie is even more beautiful than the romance part of the movie with Naveen. And while I think that that's special and I'm so incredibly happy that there's an interracial uh, love story here. Something about best friend love like hits me right in the the heart feelings like I was just thinking about that the entire movie Also just as individuals like Tiana being the headstrong determined hard-working woman Really going after her dream and knowing that wishing on a star is not enough like you have to put the elbow grease into it is so incredibly important for young women to see but also to see that you know it's also okay to be super girly and and of course like if you're not gonna if this person isn't gonna work that hard like her goal is to be married to a prince and that's fine too like it doesn't matter as long as you're nice to each other and you support each other um like it doesn't matter what type of woman that you are. There's no wrong way to be a female character as long as they just are and get to be and get to exist and support each other. Like I think that that's, I think that that's a beautiful thing. So I think their relationship to me is the BMP and just as women, like representing women, different types of women and representing how women can support each other. I think in this time, this day and age is incredibly important. That brings me to my movie ranking. So where I put this in my list, I truly, truly loved this movie for all the, the reasons that I've said, but I think there's still going to be factors that play into making other movies stand out just a little bit more um, and also just kind of personal connections to some of these films. So, in order, I'm keeping Beauty and the Beast at the top, Little Mermaid, and Aladdin, then The Princess and the Frog, Mulan, Cinderella, Pocahontas, Snow White, and Sleeping Beauty. It's getting... You guys, it's getting so much harder to actually rate these movies and rank them and compare them to one another because they're just so different in their own ways that it's it's impossible for me to, to say Aladdin is so much better than the, the Princess and the Frog because it's not, it's not like that much higher in quality as far as animation and soundtrack, but it's just like, Robin Williams kind of puts it a step ahead for me and I don't know it's just it's like picking your favorite children I don't have any children but I can only imagine that this is what it's like so that's it for the actual movie review um, I hope that you guys have enjoyed that part so far uh, now for all of you other nerds around here I'm gonna dive right into the nerd alert where we go into the origin story of this film uh, and talk about where it came from, kind of the story around it, and that'll be it for today. We're going right back to our, our favorite brothers, the Brothers Grimm. Um, they are the first ones that created the story and made it famous. And then they're in 1812. And then, of course, as we all know, like just from story oral storytelling and then all of these other adaptations there's literally hundreds of retellings of the princess and the frog or the frog prince or the frog princess or or however it's been notated in several places that the disney version of the princess and the frog is closely uh, adapted from the Frog Princess by Edie Baker that was released in 2002. We'll talk about the Brothers Grimm story first and then talk about how that evolved into the Frog Princess that of course evolved into the Princess and the Frog that we've already discussed. Now, the Brothers Grimm story isn't as grim as we're normally used to. All of the other Brothers Grimm stories so far have been like weirdly brutal or like super dark and twisted. This one, I think, is on the lighter side. Um, there is 
more of a backstory to the girl. Um, there's a, a king who has many daughters. It doesn't really say how many he has, but the youngest one is the, the princess that we're focusing on. Um, she's very beautiful. She kind of just like plays by herself most of the time. Like she goes out into the woods and like sings to herself and plays with this golden ball and has a good time, come, comes on home for dinner and kind of just repeats every day. One day where she's playing with this golden ball in the woods, she tosses it up in the air and instead of it falling into her hand, it falls on the ground and rolls and she follows it and it falls into a pond basically, or a fountain, as they call it. The water is murky, so she can't really see, so then she gets sad that, like, she lost her ball. And, of course, all of a sudden, this magic frog out of nowhere just pops up and is like, hey, girl, what's up? And she's like, ew, you're a frog. And essentially, they make a deal. Like, uh, he says, hey, I'll go down to the bottom of the pond and get it for you if you promise to take me home with you and let me eat off your plate and live in your house and be your friend and that's it and she's like yeah sure i'll do that and then he like goes down and dives into the pond and she's like she basically says like i don't know what he's talking about like he's not coming home with me so like she lies basically or admits to herself that she lied he delivers he brings her the ball he gives it to her and then she acts like all overjoyed and then just like takes off running and he's like, wait, I can't keep up with you, but she doesn't hear him and she keeps running. So she goes home, does her thing. They're eating dinner like they normally would. And then they hear like something at the door and essentially the frog like follows her home. Then the king is like, like what the fuck is this? Like what? why is there a frog at the door? And she basically tells her dad what happens. The king is like, well, you made a promise, so you kind of have to deliver on that, which like kudos to him for teaching her to like actually stick to your word. So the frog eats off her plate. He's like, I'm tired, I'm ready to go to bed. Like take me up to our room and like I'll sleep on your pillow. And she's like, ugh, I don't want to do that. And so they start going to her room and he's like saying more things and she's like, I don't want this and she literally throws the frog against the wall and then that's what turns him turns him back into a prince like why did throwing the frog against the wall turn him back into a prince same reason why is true love's kiss gonna break the curse why is impact to cement going to break the curse as well who knows but anyway so beautiful prince and basically he's like okay now we can get married and be together forever and she's like okay cool of course whatever that part's annoying like typically that would be the end of the story there's another part about a servant of the princes called his name is henry and henry comes the next morning like to pick the prince up and he's so incredibly happy like he said my heart was broken and he said that he had bound three iron bands around his heart for fear that it should break with sorrow. First question that popped into my head was, do you love him? Are you in love with the prince? Is that why you're so heartbroken? Um, which would be cool. Like, that's right. Like, you can love him. Um, and then they're like on the carriage ride home and they hear like these three pops and it's like the bands breaking and then like Henry's like just overjoyed, like his heart bursts with joy literally but like not death like it just like swells up like the Grinch and then breaks the bands around it so that's like the OG story that's where it's all started I think that there was just some like romance novelist that probably washed it over with like true love's kiss is gonna break the curse or whatever but that brings us to the Edie Baker version which is very similar in that there's a frog and there's a princess. The princess in this story is Esmeralda or Emma, which in the original story we don't have a name. But basically she's to be married to some prince and she doesn't want to marry him so she kind of just like runs off into the woods and meets a frog and the frog explains to her like, hey, I was turned into a frog by this witch, but if you kiss me, 
then I'll, the, the curse will break so she kisses him and then in this story she also turns into a frog so like this part is what the Disney movie is based off of because and I didn't even know that this one existed before watching the the princess and the frog Disney um it was always to me like you kissed a bunch of frogs until you found your prince, but the princess never turned into a frog. So this was definitely an interesting twist to the, the traditional plot. And then the next few parts are very similar in that, like they set off the two frogs, they set off to find the witch that turned the prince into a frog to ask her to change them back. They get to the spot, turns out that the witch, um, like goes missing and this other witch is taking her stuff like that part is a little tricky but i can also see like essentially there was the witch that turned the prince into a frog they go to her house another witch has taken over and taken all of her stuff her house her pets her belongings this witch wants to use these talking frogs as part of a potion to make her beautiful for forever but with the help of some of the animals like they escape they're gonna go like as plan b go see the princess's aunt during their conversation they realize that that esmeralda is was wearing the curse repelling bracelet that her aunt gave her when she was young to like ward off this kind of thing but the trick is she's got to be wearing it and kiss him again for the curse to then reverse but then she was like oh i think an otter stole it so they head back to the swamp to retrieve it okay an otter took took your bracelet they get to the swamp emma has to confront the otter she convinces somehow like through trickery to convince the otter to give it back to her they kiss and then they transform back into humans and fall in love. There's a little bit more of a like, sorry, there's, there's a little matey. She's my little princess. There's more of magical elements to this versus like the other one. I mean, like there's a curse, but like she throws them up against the wall and then that's it. Whereas this one's like, they kind of go have to go on a hunt for the cure or to get the curse reversed which is more of what like the disney adaptation sounds like and of course both of them being frogs but that's it it's really those two like while the the frog princess from 2002 is like what disney is drawing their storytelling from it's still important to kind of talk about the Brothers Grimm and like the OG stories too, like where we can and where we can find them. And who's to say there was probably somebody else that wrote about a frog and a prince and princess and something before then, but we're going back as far as we possibly can with what time I have. But that's it. Um, again, I love this movie so much. I really enjoyed watching it again. Because this is a story that we're relatively familiar with and there's like so many resources readily available, um, there was also quite a few articles on how the story was accepted by the world and by the black community and I think that that would be a really great resource to share. So I'm going to share an article below as well um, from The Undefeated. I'm going to share that because it was really insightful article about like the pros and the cons things that disney did well things that they could have improved on i think overall as far as my take on it i think there were so many opportunities for disney to stack the creative team with more black representation more writers more directors but with that being said, through this article, I found out, like, they pitched the idea to Oprah, and then Oprah had to have a part as Tiana's mom, and heavily supported the movie, and they got uh, animators from the Proud family, from the Disney Channel show, to come in and help put a little bit more style and culture into the film, and 
They listened to people when they said Maddie is not an appropriate name for a young black woman. And I think that there were good steps in the right direction. But of course, we can always do more. But yeah, I'll share the article because of course the ideas are not my own and I'd rather you guys go straight to the source uh, to read those and um, understand kind of the cultural phenomenon that is the first black Disney princess. Because they made some really good points about like the, the studio and opportunities that it created for the Disney parks to hire a black Disney princess. So it, generating more diverse jobs and I, I just really loved the article so definitely read that and if you guys have any thoughts absolutely share I want to make it clear though that this is a positive space and that I only want to learn more and do what I can to really just grow and, and make the Disney community more diverse in the ways that I can so thank you guys so much for joining. Um, I hope you liked it. If you did, go ahead and hit that like button. Make sure that you click subscribe and go ahead and head on over to Instagram and follow me at magicxmolly. But I hope you guys have a wonderful week and we'll see you later. Say bye bye, meaty. Say bye bye. Get with meaty. I got glitter on you, sorry. <laughs>